Alright, good afternoon everyone. Yes, we'll be starting in 5 minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today to celebrate AMSA Health Day 2021, which is celebrated every year on the 2nd of May to commemorate the founding of AMSA Health Day Malaysia. The theme for this year's Health Day is Know Your Senses, Vision and Hearing. And I would like to warmly welcome all of you to the I Hear You webinar. My name is Yung Kun, a second year medical student, MC for this event, and on behalf of Taylor's University, I would like to extend a very warm and hearty welcome to all of you. We appreciate you taking off your busy schedule to join us today, and we hope that you find this program to be conducive and captivating. To move on, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the organizations that supported our webinar. Thank you, Malaysian Association for the Blind, for the collaboration. And thank you, Vista Eye Specialist Malaysia, for sponsoring our event. Thanks to Vista, 
every participant here today will be walking away with 80 ringgits worth of free gifts. And not to forget, special thanks to AMSA and TUMS for organizing this event. Now, let me introduce you to the agenda. We have three great speakers lined up for you to discuss about the different medical aspects of the ear and the eye, as well as to how we can uplift the blind community in Malaysia. Also, don't forget to stay till the end for our group photo session. Before we start, I'd like to remind everyone to mute your microphones throughout the webinar. If anyone has any questions during the presentation, you may scan the QR code that is displayed now and type in your questions later. We'll bring them up during the Q&A session. Kindly remember to include the name of the speakers when you type in the questions so that we can reduce the confusion. The link will be shared in the Zoom chat box. Please use this Slido link to send all your questions and not send in the Zoom chat box as we would like to maintain the privacy of participants. Also, you'll be required to stay till the end of the webinar to obtain a certificate we have prepared for you. So please, yes, kindly enjoy these two hours and hopefully learn a lot from this webinar. Thank you. All right, move on. Due to unforeseen circumstances, Professor Dr. Rusty Binodin is unable to join us today to give his opening remarks. So we have the president from TUMS, Mr. Allen, to give his opening remarks on behalf of Professor Rusty. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Yun Kun. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Taylor's University Medical Society, I'd like to welcome all of you to our webinar today. It has been a great pleasure for us to be able to continue our webinar series by Taylor's University School of Medicine in conjunction with our Asian Medical Students Association Health Day 2021. Our theme for this year's Health Day is Know Your Senses, Vision and Hearing. We have a lineup of amazing and inspiring speakers today here today, Dr. Prabal and Prof. Ihab Ali, also our internal clinical lecturers in our School of Medicine. And on top of that, we also have a special guest, Mr. George, representing the Malaysian Association for the Blind. The organizing committee has also planned a very interesting and interactive session with amazing prize to be won today. So stay tuned and I hope all of you would enjoy the webinar today. Thank you. That's all for me. Thank you, Mr. Allen, for the opening remarks. Kindly remember, my everyone to mute your microphones throughout the webinar and type in your questions in the Slido and please do not send in a Zoom chat box. And also remember that to include the name of the speakers when you type in a question so, so that we can reduce the confusion. For now, we officially start our I Hear You webinar. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Prabhau. Dr. Prabhau is currently the discipline coordinator ophthalmology at the School of Medicine, Taylor's University, Malaysia, where he was recently conferred the EMAS Award, which is also known as the Exemplary Meritorious Academic Staff Award. He is a clinical ophthalmologist and has been actively teaching and training medical students in the specialty for over 20 years. Assessments, blended models, and competence-based learning have been the ABCs of his work as a medical educator. His areas of interest include glaucoma, strabismus, and community ophthalmology. He takes pride in his passion for the specialty and drive to evolve a better teaching learning philosophy. Today, he'll be sharing the topic with us, I Can See You. Let us welcome Dr. Prabal for his presentation. Thank you so much. I guess I can share my screen now. So a very good afternoon to all of you and thank you so much AMSA and TUMS for uh, providing me this opportunity of actually talking to novice medical students, especially most of you from the preclinical side and uh, this opportunity actually to introduce you to the ophthalmic sciences. When Nicole first messaged me, I was rather perplexed how in 20 minutes I'm going to be talking to you about ocular diseases, importance of vision, but let's see how it goes. We have a question answer session to follow as well. As a medical student, you're aware of the external appearance of the eye. You can identify the eyebrows, the eyelids, 
and uh, you can see part of the eyeball that's visible through this opening between the lids called the palpebral aperture. On a closer view, I'm sure you can identify the structures that are visible to us, very important part, the brilliantly transparent cornea here, through which you can see the colored part of the eye, the iris, and a central opening, the pupil. The white fibrous coat is the sclera here. This very delicate organ, the eye, is actually placed in a very protective bony cavity. That's the orbit. And if we talk about the structure of the eyeball, the eyeball has three very distinct coverings, the cornea and the sclera, that's the outer fibrous coat, which provides shape to the eyeball. Then is the inner or the middle vascular coat, which is primarily responsible for providing nutrition. And in the yellow color that you see is the nervous layer, that's the retina. Inside the eyeball are important structures like the lens and major part of this globe is occupied by a gelatinous substance, that's the vitreous gel. The eye, when you come to the study of the ophthalmic sciences, you would realize provides us with a very unique opportunity of actually being able to visualize the microvasculature when we can examine the retina. And this is what a normal retina looks like. The function is primarily to see. And if I'm asked to define what vision is, it's actually, it involves a whole lot of things not just our ability to perceive an object, identify objects, see them in detail. We are able to appreciate a whole lot of colors, contrast, and there's a specific area that we can see which we define as our visual field. And in the normal process, how the eye works is that the incident light rays that come from infinity, as they pass through the major refractive surfaces, that's the cornea and the lens, they focus on the center part of the retina, that's the macula, and that's when you get a clear, distinct image. When I was asked to explain the importance of vision, I thought this is just this picture with you trying to just imagining, closing your eyes and just imagine the world around you. I do not have to talk more about the importance of vision. And if we talk about how the visual disabilities spread across the world, well, this data may be two or three years old. And uh, it's amazing to understand that almost more, all 285 million people globally are affected with impaired vision. And almost 40 million are actually blind. If we identify what are the important causes of blindness worldwide, well, the leading cause of blindness still in the world is cataract, followed by uncorrected refractive errors. Now, to me as a clinical ophthalmologist, these two causes don't really worry me so much because they are perfectly treatable. What worries me more is what is down the list, glaucoma, age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, and things like that, which can irreversibly blind a person. And this damage that happens can actually not be reversed and cannot be treated. If I'm talking about the loss of vision, I must, for you as a novice medical students who are going to be health professionals, I must emphasize here that this loss of vision may not essentially be sudden, it may be gradual, and it's usually, it may be, we classify them, the major causes as either gradual, sudden, with pain or without pain. But besides this loss of vision, there are also other very important visual complaints which we need to be aware of. Some, for example, patient complaining of black spots in front of the eye, flashes, or having distorted vision, or have suddenly having a double vision or diplopia, 
these can actually be very alarming symptoms. So we also need to understand that when there are patients presenting with these complaints, they may might be pointing to some very important ocular emergency. Coming back to what are the leading causes of blindness, here you can see how the lens inside the eye becomes progressively opaque, resulting in cataract. And because the light rays cannot pass through, there is a, the blurring of vision is more or less uniform. The entire Im image, if you would compare the two images on the, the two pictures below there, the entire, this progressive blurring of vision, then no details are actually visible. The other common cause is refractive error, and I'm sure many of us are wearing glasses and we've been, you've been reading about these ever since you were in school. Another important cause could be corneal blindness, and you see how the cornea becomes opaque here, again, impeding the or obstructing the light rays to go through. I mentioned earlier about glaucoma, how with raised intraocular pressure, as the pressure inside the eye builds up, it causes progressive damage to the optic nerve. And you know how the nerve fibers do not regenerate, and therefore there is significant and irreversible blindness. Also with age, we might see certain changes in the patient's retina, especially the center part. And uh, today in the Western world, age-related macular degeneration is the leading cause of irreversible blindness. Many etiological factors like smoking, we'll talk about those a little later. Now, just to emphasize how differently the vision may be affected. Again, the vision is being affected, but in cataract, there's more blurring of the entire field. Whereas in glaucoma, the patient can only see in the center part, the peripheral vision is lost. And in age-related macular degeneration, it's just the reverse. The patient can not see the center part. So they can they often complain of not being able to see whatever object they're trying to focus on. There's distortion of images, et cetera. Having talked about the visual complaints, I must again reiterate here that there can be non-visual complaints as well. And very commonly, you would see patients presenting with red eyes, with pain in the eye, inability to tolerate bright light. There's some uh, foreign body sensation, itching, et cetera. And let's quickly look at some of those conditions so that you are aware that these are also, some of them are very important ocular emergencies. But when I talk about red eye, which is the most common of the presentation in, the, uh, in an ocular uh, emergency setting uh, set up, it could be due to some very simple conditions like infections in the conjunctiva, which could be because of an allergic response as well. But more dangerous are the especially infective lesions on the cornea. Now, our cornea being exposed is very prone to develop certain, catch certain infections. And you might see how this can lead to a corneal opacification with pus collection or in the anterior chamber. This inflammatory process may even be endogenous that's inside the eye. And often with many systemic diseases, you might, you see that there is an endogenous inflammation inside the eye, which can be very severe and the patient may actually lose his vision. I earlier talked about glaucoma. Another ocular emergency that you need to be aware about is that there can be a sudden rise in the pressure inside the eye and the patient can present with an acute painful red eye with nausea, vomiting, and this we typically describe as an acute congestive glaucoma. Being exposed, the eye is also prone to get trauma. And even with penetrating trauma, there can be some sharp object that can go into the eye or with road traffic accidents. It's such a delicate structure. So now these again repair, require surgical repair urgently. Chemical injuries can often be very devastating for the patient's vision. Besides this, the eyelids are also a very common site for tumors, both benign and malignant tumors. Not just the eyelid, the most 
common ocular malignancy in children is a retinoblastoma, which can be as severe as you can see in the picture there. Children often with refractive error or for some other causes could, not just children, but yeah, even adults could present with misalignment of the eyes, leading to a squint or a strabismus. And uh, the eye, as I mentioned earlier, it's often affected in a whole lot of systemic diseases. And the retina gives us a very unique opportunity of examining uh, the retina and knowing about the uh, systemic condition, the underlying systemic condition. So for example, here in Malaysia, with so many diabetics, diabetic retinopathy is a very important cause for blindness. In hypercholesterolemia, which again is so common here, you see these yellowish excrescences, these anthelasmas, even uh, systemic hypertension can lead to certain vascular accidents in the eye like, for example, occlusion of the central retinal vein. Infective conditions can affect the eye differently, and even conditions wherein there is a raised intracranial pressure, the optic nerve may be affected. Now, talking more about, the, let's come back and talk a little bit about the current pandemic. Ever since the pandemic began, very soon we started getting all these results uh, studies being published beginning from Wuhan, how uh, there were certain ocular manifestations of COVID-19. There, there was talk how we can actually diagnose uh, COVID-19 with the ocular fluid. So tear film, the, vi the virus was there. And now with the newer strains, especially the UK strain and the uh, South African strain, the acute follicular conjunctivitis is actually one of the earliest manifestations that patients are presenting with. But to me, when I'm talking to our student community here, what is more widespread and worrisome is this. We moved on to a complete online teaching platform work from home, and all of us are spending more and more time on our devices. Now, way back in 2019, we compared a whole lot of surveys and found that Malaysians were spending almost 14 hours a day, an average Malaysian was spending 14 hours a day on the digital devices. And uh, one very common thing that was found, almost 75% of the people would complain of features of eye strain, what we call as the computer vision syndrome. If you are on your device for a long time, you get some watering from the eye and uh, the letters seem to blur together. And this I'm talking about 2019. So you can imagine how much, how many folds actually more than it's uh, said that predicted almost 60 to 70% of the time has increased. I don't know how much it would be. And uh, I was sharing it with my group the other day that every time I messaged Nicole, whatever time of the day it was, she's always online. I found it was very efficient, but that also told me that she was spending so much time on a digital device. And what is more worrisome to me is because we've had for the past one decade, or more, there have been studies that are done, laboratory studies on lower animals, and it's been shown that these, the light wavelengths that are emitted with our digital devices, they actually produce changes in the macula or in the retina of the lower animals, which are consistent with the age-related macular degenerative changes that I was talking about, and I, how I talked about it's a uh, irreversible, it causes irreversible blindness. It's a leading cause of blindness in the world, in the Western world today, irreversible blindness. So I was happy when uh, Nicole said, you need to talk to us about how to take care of our eyes in the era of smartphones and tablets. The first thing everyone, each and every ophthalmologist would say, a very simple thing to follow is the 20 rule. Every 20 minutes, take a 20 second break and look at something which is more than 20 feet away. Now these very small, tiny breaks can actually make a world of difference. 
an important part if you're spending a lot of time on your device. I have to take online sessions all the time. And then uh, uh, even on weekends, Alan asks me to do some webinars. So make sure you position your device very well. Now, these are ergonomics. We, we also talk about, you know, what kind of a chair you should have, what kind of, I mean, because it's not just the eye, it's a whole lot of other things, but I'll just talk about the ocular part of it. Make sure that the device is away. A usual good distance is between 20 to 25 inches, and it's not at the same level, it's slightly below. If you are spending a lot of time, use filters. Now, where, I mean, I don't know if you can see that in the video or not, but if you notice my glasses carefully, there's a very, there's a colored tinge that you would see as I move. And actually, because I have these anti-reflective coatings or filters in my glasses. Those of you who are not wearing glasses can actually even have a plain, a plain pair of glasses with an anti-reflective glass. You can, there are now filters available or screens available to cover your device. Some very simple things can be helpful. Blink more often. You're renewing your tear film, you're soothing the covering of your eye, all the features of dry eye and those that are of, of the uh, digital eye strain that I was talking about would be reduced. If you're feeling really tired, one simple exercise, which I've always found very useful is what is called palming. Now, wash your, I mean, your hands are clean, just rub your palms together and without the glasses, of course, close your eyes and cover your eyes for a while. But these very simple things can actually help you or ensure that you do not get the features of eye strain. Uh, let me also take this opportunity to talk to you about some very important aspects in a routine care or routine eye care for us. If you remember, I was talking about conditions like glaucoma, about refractive errors. Now, often, these conditions go undiagnosed. And these can lead to certain permanent changes. In case of optic nerve, it leads to, uh, in case of glaucoma, it, needs to, it leads to optic nerve damage and uncorrected refractive errors. You might get something called a lazy eye or amblyopia. So therefore, screening is a very important part. We do run important screening programs. For example, we regularly go to schools and try and screen patients. And if I have time, I might, I might just share. Two years back, Prof. Rusli took me to Sarawak. And uh, we were doing this screening at the school, wherein, I mean, I was surprised that uh, actually, uh, and it was a weekend. So we got just maybe 150 or 200 students. And out of those, a staggering 45% did not have 6-6 six, six visual acuity and they had never been screened. I had two of my uh, students, one from Taylor's who was there and, and the other one from another university. And she said, well, I have amblyopia and I was never screened at school. And I now understand why screening programs are so very important. Adults, anyone over the age of 40 years, you always screen for glaucoma. Every time they visit an ophthalmologic clinic, we measure the pressure. If there is a identifiable risk factor, we go on and screen further. Besides screening, protect your eyes. The first and foremost, protect from the hazardous effects of sunlight or the UV component. Always good to invest in a nice pair of shades. But make sure when I say nice pair of shades, when I, and I use the term good to invest. So buy a good quality glass. There are all these fake lens glasses available, which are really cheap, but the filters aren't really protecting you from UV rays. Trauma can lead to significant damage. So protect yourself from flying objects. Smoking, you're smoking now, 20 years later, the most important risk factor 40 years later for age-related macular degeneration is smoking. Reduce your screen time. So protect your eyes as much as you can. An important part is eat right. 
Now, we were doing this session yesterday and I was talking about how green leafy vegetables, pigmented fruits, all yellow, orange fruits, mangoes, papayas, carrots, essential for eye health, fish, cod liver oil, very good. And how we use these, the government has excellent supplementation programs, so make sure you're eating right. Simple techniques to care for your eyes. Infections are often transmitted because while you're touching your face, you touch your eyes. Make sure you don't do that. Any foreign body sensation, anything went into the eye, you felt something, you're going on a motor and something goes into the eye, don't rub your eye. That can potentially damage this or scratch the cornea and cause much damage. It's a very good practice, especially in, in, in tropical climates. Allergies are so common. Use cold water, cold, clean water to eyes, to wash your eyes multiple times in the day. And most importantly, if there's any small little problem in the eye, your eye hurts, you don't look, there's something in the external appearance, there's some redness, you cannot see very clearly, or if you're suffering from headaches, please do not ignore these, go and see an eye doctor. So I'm, I always, I created this, uh, I say uh, one of my uh, interests was uh, community of thermology, the MC read out. As a postgraduate student, I was very fond of, the, I created this mnemonic specs and how we would go and educate people on what can be the essential tips to take care of your eyes. So thank you so much, uh, AMSA and uh, Tooms. And um, I hope I was in time to uh, um, finish the, this brief introduction. Uh, I would love to answer any questions, I guess perhaps later. Right. Thanks, Dr. Prabhu, for such an informative presentation. I believe now we have a better and deeper understanding for the different clinical manifest manifestation for the pathology in the eye and how we teenagers can actually take care of our precious eye better. So participants, you're welcome to send your questions to Dr. Prabal through this QR code or link sent in the Zoom chat. We will be having our Q&A sessions after Prof. Ehab. All right, moving along. It's my pleasure to introduce our very great second speaker, Associate Professor Dr. Ehab Ali. Prof. Ehab is an associate professor in the Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences since 2013. He completed his Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery in Alexandria University in Egypt. He then furthered his master's degree in ear, nose and throat and head and neck surgery. He is a medical practitioner in the Malaysian Medical Council and he is a member of Egyptian Orthohinolaryngology Society of Surgeons, a researcher in a head and neck surgery and a consultant of ENT and hip and neck surgeon. Today, he'll be sharing with us on the topic, I'm all ears. Let us welcome Prof. Eha. Thank you very much for the introduction. Hello and uh, very afternoon, very good afternoon to all of you. And thank you for the invitation for this session. Well done, Dr. Brabal. As usual, very interesting and uh, nice presentation. Uh, we benefited a lot. Now I know where to go. Uh, today, like Dr. Prabhupal said, that uh, it is very, very short time for uh, to do anything about the ear, but uh, I will try my best to do. I, I just put uh, some slides for the most important and uh, issues related to the ear. So allow me to share my screen. Uh, Can see it? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I will just talk briefly about the, the anatomy of the ear. I will not go into details, but the ear has three components or three sites, which are the external ear starting from the uh, pinna. And uh, we call it also auricle. And then the external auditory canal, this we call it the external ear. And this is almost all cartilage except the last two thirds of the external auditory canal is bony and is all covered by skin. And uh, then 
the tympanic membrane, which is the border between the external ear and the middle ear, and this is uh, uh, this uh, uh, tympanic membrane is uh, consists of three layers. The outer one is continuously with the skin. It is a skin epithelial, uh, continuous with the skin of the external canal, and then a fibrous tissue layer in between, and then mucosal layer, which is continuous with the mucosa of the uh, middle ear. The external canal is 2.5 cm. And like I said, it's all covered by skin. And uh, the outer third is uh, totally cartilaginous, like the pinna, and it's continuous actually together. And uh, this is 8 mm. And then after that, 17 mm is the bony canal. And uh, the, 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 the factory in the external canal is the outer two thirds. Why? Because it has all the glands. Sweat glands, crying glands, uh, uh, ceremonious glands, uh, sebaceous uh, glands. So everything in the outer uh, one third, which is the cartilaginous one. But the inner bony part, this has nothing except the bone and the skin. Okay. And it is not straight, meaning that when you want to, when you become a doctor, if you become an ENT, uh, you must uh, uh, pull the ear, the auricle, upwards, backwards, and laterally just to straighten the canal and make the cartilaginous and bony canal on one line just to see the contents and the tympanic membrane nicely. Otherwise, you cannot see anything. Okay, like we said, the tympanic membrane is three layers. It's around 1 cm in diameter. And the, it is uh, uh, set obliquely in the external auditory canal. It's not, uh, uh, it has a bit uh, oblique uh, edge and it is uh, pearly gray in color. And this actually, the contents, I will not go into details, but these are the uh, appearance of the canal, the malleus. And we will see the contents actually of the, of the middle ear, then you will know uh, what show on the tympanic membrane. And this tympanic membrane, when we come later into the, uh, 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 in the presentation, it is a big part, a big important part of the hearing system. Uh, some of the people, <laughs> they think that when the tympanic membrane is perforated, you will lose uh, uh, your hearing. Of course, you can lose uh, some of it, but not all of it. And it depends on the site, it depends on the, um, uh, how big is it. It's a lot of factors, and we will come to this later. And then we will come to the middle ear, and we call it middle ear cleft because it, it is a one unit, one component. It is one room. Eustachian tube, which is coming from the uh, back of the nose, uh, and uh, start the cartilaginous end there, and then it extends up to the middle ear, and then the middle ear cavity proper, and then the mastoid air cells and the mastoid antrum. It is all uh, 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 coming from the same embryological origin. It is all uh, united together. It is all continuously together, and the same mucosa is covering the whole part. That's why any pathology happens in one of these parts, it will extend to all the parts. Okay, and then uh, the station tube is around 30.6 cm. And uh, it, of course, it, uh, uh, all of us, we know that it will balance the pressure. Even you, if you didn't take, take ANT, when you go to flight and you have some flu, you will feel pressure on the ear. Why the station tube is not functioning? And then you will do Valsalva without knowing this is Valsalva. And you will close your nose and mouth and you will blow out just to open, forcibly open the station tube and exchange the uh, pressure. So these are the contents, some of the contents of the middle ear, the three ossicles. And uh, uh, this is how it works. The sound waves collected by the auricle, it will come and hit the tympanic membrane, and then all the ossicles will move. Malleus, incus, stapes will move and send these impulses to the inner ear. 
The inner ear, it is two components. All of them, we call it labyrinth, but uh, it is one vestibule, which is the semicircular canal, utricle, and saccule, and this is concerned the balance. And another part, which is the uh, cochlea, and this is the sense organ of hearing. So this uh, labyrinth, uh, we call it inner ear, and we call also it is, uh, uh, okay, we'll not go into much detail just to take some of the time in the pathologies. So what is these two parts? The cochlea is a coil. It is two and a half turns. And uh, it is a snail shell, uh, looks like snail shell. And uh, this is actually in the, uh, uh, in the inferior part. We call it pars inferior because it is lower level from the uh, uh, pars superior, which is the vestibule. Okay, And this actually, all the labyrinths, it is soft sacs and tubes and it is filled with fluids, whatever, whatever functional or protective. And then it is again protected by bony shell, bony coverage to protect it. Otherwise, all of us, we will lose hearing and balance. So it's uh, 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 this two and a half turns, the, actually uh, this cochlea is uh, rotating around one longitudinal axis, which we call it medullus. And uh, 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 from the base, the cochlear nerve pierces it because it is a bit perforated. There is a way for the cochlear nerve to go uh, in and uh, to go to the uh, scala tympani and it will be below the basilar membrane to receive this because the nerve actually cannot carry uh, mechanical waves and the sound is mechanical wave. So the hair cells, it will be con uh, converting this mechanical waves into uh, electrical impulses, and then it will be taken by the uh, nerve and sent centrally to be recognized and translated, which it comes back to you as a sound. Okay, the vestibular system, actually it is, uh, uh, the vestibule is the same, the same concept, the same hair cells, the same bas basal membrane, but it differs in the, uh, uh, how it looks, and it differs in the, functionality. What is the stimulus and what is the direction of stimulus is a bit different. Here is the sound waves, but here is the rotation. So when you rotate like this, angular rotation, which we call it angular acceleration, okay, uh, this actually, it is the function of the semicircular canal. So it will excite one sensory nerve fibers and it will inhibit another one, which is the opposite side. So it will bring you to the center. So it will maintain your balance. Whenever it fails, you will get dizzy or you will get imbalanced, okay? For the linear acceleration, which front, back, and up, down, this we call it, uh, the, the one, uh, 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 the function is for the utricle and secure. In the semicircular canal, the sense organ is the crista. In the utricle and saccule, the sense organ is the macula. And these are the sense organs which, when stimulated by external rotation, by external movement action, it will respond to it. Okay? Is it simple and clear, guys? I'm so sorry, this is very short time to <laughs> describe. And simple and clear, Prof. Okay, so this is just a hint about the anatomy of the ear and how your ear looks from inside. And what is the physiology that you can hear and you can uh, uh, be balanced related to the surrounding. Okay, uh, now we go to the uh, uh, second point, which is noise induced hearing loss. And noise induced hearing loss actually. Uh, uh, it is important in one aspect that uh, uh, it is related to work, mostly, uh, related to prolonged exposure to sounds. And uh, there is, if you know what, uh, I think all of you know, SOXO. Uh, when we have the committee of SOXO and we see patients coming from the company sites and uh, we see patients coming 
complaining of hearing loss, and we do hearing tests for them. So if it is proved, you know that before you go to any company, uh, you must have full medical checkup. And this full medical checkup, why? Because the company wants to guarantee that you are okay and you are going to benefit the company. You will not be sick and you will go to take MC every day and you will not be admit and blah, blah, blah. So they must have full report medically about you. Okay. And when you go and report to work, they know that your basic medical aspect is good enough for you. And when you have chronic diseases, like hypertension, diabetes, whatever, okay, this is up to the company to agree or not, and, but they will have the knowledge that you have this. So if any complication happened, they already agreed to take you diabetic, to take you as a hypertensive patient. But the rest are okay. So when you have a complaint, for example, hearing loss, so you will go and do hearing test. Then it ends up by noise-induced hearing loss. So this is related to your work. Why? Because when you, when you join the company, you was totally clear. You was totally normal. Your hearing was normal levels. So you have been affected by your work and you developed noise-induced hearing loss. And someone will ask, uh, maybe from another cause. No, because the other cause will not give the same uh, curve, the same uh, uh, thing we see. It is a characteristic curve for noise-induced hearing loss. And this can compensate the employer uh, and uh, the employee, and we can give him uh, early pension, light work, some money, or, or, or it depends on also our report as uh, doctors. So it is very important. So what is the non uh, noise-induced hearing loss? It is uh, one of the most 10 uh, common occupational illness, and it is due to prolonged noise exposure, more than 85 decibel uh, for the patient. It can be anything, a conductive hearing loss, or sensory neural, or mixed, or partial total unilateral, but anything can be. But it is commonly, it's bilateral, course, it's very rare to be unilateral because the environment and the affection is always uh, together uh, same. And uh, it is a high frequency sensory neural hearing loss. It means that when we go like this, high frequency means from 125 decibel until 2K, okay, this we call it low frequencies. And from 2K until 8K, we call high frequencies. Can you see the curve? You see the V-shape? Whatever the V-shape, because this is actually the exposure period after one year, after two years, after three years. So uh, this, all of them, even almost normal, but there is a V-shape. There is a V-shape, okay? And this is what we call characteristic curve for the noise-induced hearing loss, that it goes normally, normal curve until 2000, and then it goes down, whatever it dip into which point, because according to the, the more prolonged exposure, the more dipping of the V node, okay? And then it goes back to normal at the 8,000 decibel, okay? And this is, like I said, characteristic curve for noise-induced hearing loss. And when it is there, so we can, like I said, compensate the employee and get him his rights, okay? And these uh, sensory neural others can be by age, by autotoxicity, by uh, uh, head trauma, by concussion. It can be a lot of things. And when you see the, 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 uh, the people, they are different from each other. Uh, maybe Alan will ex be exposed to the same environment, the same uh, uh, timing, the same uh, uh, decibel, okay? Like me, but I will lose hearing before him. So it is a sub susceptibility, genetic factors, and so on. So this is the curve and the, uh, the duration of exposure. And this is just take a look on it. This is just the 
the uh, normal, uh, 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 for example, the normal conversation, it equals 50 to 60 decibel and so on. So you can know if you uh, want to be exposed to a lot because all of, I will not say all, but most of you will be having the headphones and boom, 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 boom. And this is a very loud music, very loud. It's okay. All of us, we like it. All of us, we did it, but not prolong it and not that high and not to uh, uh, a lot, uh, I mean, long time. We must take care of our ears, okay? Because you are always saying what I'm all ear ears, okay? Today, I'm not all ear ears. Of course, I'm just speaking, but it is always all ears. So you must take a lot of care about this. How to prevent it? I can talk about this for six hours, <laughs> but this is just take a look on the conclusion because this is very professional and it doesn't matter what we do, except if you become ENT or in the rehabilitation center. But the most important that we have a health, occupational and health, uh, safety committee in all the countries nationwide and globally and each country it has its own rules but all the countries mostly they are following the uh, uh, WHO one uh, the, the, the central one and they have regulations which is a bit different from country to country but most of the countries and the majorities are following the same rules same exposure time same uh, uh, duration uh, same level, the, the, uh, if you are, because if you are uh, working in machinery, you must be exposed to high uh, sound levels. But we have some like noise monitoring, engineering controls, and, and this we reduce the hassle and we reduce the effect of the sounds on your ears, not to end up by noise induced hearing loss. Okay, now we come to the third point. And uh, this is actually, uh, in the past, there was one guy, uh, actually he's a Polish, and then became American nationality. He's a Polish American, uh, Leo Gindgistan. And this guy, he uh, saw his wife uh, putting some, wrapping some uh, clothes and playing in the, the baby ear, cleaning it. So he got the idea why I don't do it as a business. And he became very, very famous. Uh, actually, the first brand he, he uh, invented, uh, he called it uh, 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 Gay's Baby, okay? And this was the Q-stick or the cotton buds. And until now, it is very, very famous, of course. And became very popular and he became very, very rich guy, but he brought the disaster for all of us, okay? And... Uh, the, 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 the doctors committee and the ENT uh, committees all over the world, pushing, pushing, pushing for prohibiting it. Unfortunately, the most they can, they, they, can, they, they did that it will be written there that it is uh, dangerous and not safe. And, and, and I doubt even you, 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 you buy these cute stick and uh, Q-tips and the, the uh, cotton buds almost every day. Have you seen this warning sign? I doubt. But it is written there in most of the brands, but nobody even seen. So it brings a lot of disaster. It brings a lot of headache. And I will tell you, I will show you some of uh, the photos for the damage, but I'm telling you, in my life, I saw disaster from this. I saw a lot of perforations of the tympanic membrane. I saw a lot of trauma, a lot of lacerations of the skin. It is a disaster. And then the usual question will be asked. So if you become ENT, please, when your patient, 100% he will ask you, so how we clean our ears? You tell him that God created it clean itself. That's why he, he, he created the wax. He created the hair. He created the sebaceous glands. So it cleans itself. Just leave it alone. So you just take some... And by the way, this is very true. When you put the, the uh, uh, ear swab, uh, your cotton bud, you know, uh, you will really feel nice. You will feel relieved. You will feel something good. 
okay? And it will become after that habit. It is start, maybe itchiness, maybe uh, I want to be clean after shower, blah, blah. But after that, it will become a habit and it's very difficult to leave it, okay? So please leave it alone and don't bring headache for yourself. The last thing is the ear candling. And the ear candling, I will just tell you one thing. This, what is the ear candling? Actually, all of you, you know, I think that the ear candling, especially in Asia, it's very famous and it is done in the spa centers. Just they think that it will bring all the toxicity, all the wax, all the dirt out of the ear. And they will put the candle and they will put a protection uh, foils or whatever below it just to I will tell you again in my clinic I saw a lot a lot of disaster but the most recent one she was Japanese lady and she came to me one and a half hours under general anesthesia because she was screaming in the OT I am cleaning the ear from the wax and from the trauma she got one and a half hours under, you know, one and a half hours, I can do uh, uh, around three or four tonsillectomies. So you are talking about disaster. And I am, I am mentioning here some of the damage from the ear candling, but it is a lot more than that. And the FDA tried the best, but they were so late and they started in 2010 to attack these centers and attack this thing and try to uh, uh, advise the people to stop these things, but unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, uh, even the traditional medicine, the people go a lot for it. Uh, anything paramedical, the patient, if desperate, or the patient doesn't believe much in the medical, or he's scared, or it is very costly for, for uh, him, he will run to the uh, 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 traditional ways, and he will run to uh, such things, and it, most of the time it ends up by disaster. It may benefit one, I don't think even, but even if it benefits one, we don't calculate it like that. We, we don't say that, yeah, 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 one time it happened like that. No, it is not, <laughs> it's not that way, no. What is the majority? What is the overall effect? What is the overall benefit and what is the overall hazards? And then we built our uh, uh, opinion about it. And this is not only in medicine, it is everywhere. Do you think in business, if you did this business, you may win one time, but after that you lose all the time. Are you going to do it? So it is not uh, calculated like that. And overall, it is very, very dangerous. A lot of hazards, a lot of side effects, and uh, should be prohibited. But of course, you know that these kind of things and the traditional medicine, and we don't have the authority and power to stop it completely. Uh, I think, thank you very much for, uh, for uh, your time. And uh, uh, I think it's enough uh, from my side. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Prof. Ehab, for the sharing. And we have learned so much from you today. Ladies and gentlemen, feel free to upload your questions for Prof. Ehab through the Slido link now. Once again, thank you, Dr. Prabal and Prof. Ehab for such an educational pre presentation for now. We go ahead with our Q&A session. All right. All right. So for the first question, first questions for Prof. Ehab, what is the prevalence of hearing loss among adolescents? Uh, adolescents, uh, uh, most of it, it is a trauma. Most of it, it is conductive hearing loss. Uh, and the, 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 the most common one is the uh, conductive hearing loss, I mean, the most common cause is the wax. Uh, it will block the external auditory canal and it will reduce the amount of mechanical waves of sounds that go into the tympanic membrane, so it ends by, uh, but this is, uh, uh, it has solution. But in the adolescent stage, it is mostly uh, conductive hearing loss, uh, whether it is from trauma or wax or infections. All right. Thank you, Prof. Eha. I think we have another question for Dr. Pavel. Uh, is it recommended to, sorry, is it recommended for young students, like 17 to 18 years old, 
to undergo laser, laser eye surgery to correct their eyesight. Okay, now that's a very important aspect in practice where youngsters who are not so happy with their glasses have this question. I must mention here, if you, the, the, the question was very nicely framed, 17 to 18 years, certainly no. We always wait for the refractive error to stabilize and the growth period to stop. So always after the age of 21, 22 years and making sure that for the last two years, there's been no change in the refractive error. And then the second part was laser eye correction. Well, there are a whole lot of other factors which determine the kind of surgery that's indicated to correct the refractive error. It depends primarily on the health of the, and the thickness of the cornea. So 17 to 18 years, certainly no, you need to wait. All right. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Prabhup, I'm so sorry. So another question is for you. What are the ways to prevent blindness in a family with a history of severe glaucoma? Screening, screening, screening. There's a family history of glaucoma. Make sure that everyone goes through the screening process and screening does not involve only measurement of intraocular pressure, but importantly, and essentially two other things, which is ophthalmoscopy, or actually we do these, we have these awesome nerve fiber layer analyzers, ocular imaging techniques, where we rapidly screen and detect nerve fiber damage much before the fundoscopic or visible changes appear. And number three, perimetry or assessment of loss of visual function in terms of visual field measurement. So three things, essential part of screening. Again, it depends on what type of glaucoma, but I presume we are talking, I'm talking about the more common primary open angle glaucoma. So screening is a very important part. Right. And then what causes colorblindness? And are there any treatments for colorblindness? And the question is for you. Okay. Well, one important part or cause of colorblindness, and I'm sure those of you are, you are you're still in your preclinical years, you've read about congenital colorblindness, where there is a defect in the photoreceptors. So you've talked, you've brought, you've read about red green blindness and, uh, you know, Tutrinopsia, et cetera, et cetera, all those congenital causes. For a very long time, our answer was it's hereditary, congenital, the photoreceptors haven't developed, there's no treatment. Fortunately, today, for the past four or five years, we have these, uh, it's not a treatment, but something that's going to help patients with color blindness, specifically certain types of color blindness that can help them identify colors. So we get these special glasses, which have filters and they specially uh, reduce or cut off certain overlap wavelengths. So the patient is at least able to, you know, match color for his clothes and have a, have a better functional vision, so to say. Uh, the other part is an acquired color blindness, which can be because of certain diseases in the eye, optic nerve diseases. These, of course, can be reversed if the primary disease is corrected. All right, thank you. I think there's another one more question for you. Is it recommended for people who have short-sightedness short to wear contact lens? And will wearing contact lenses lead to any eye diseases? Okay. Now, I, uh, when you come to the ophthalmology rotation, I always, I do one dedicated session talking about problems associated with contact lenses. Like Dr. Uh, like Prof. Ihab was sharing you slides with people wearing, you know, doing the, using earbuds and then coming with severe uh, infections and problems. We come across patients with contact lens wear and they have severe infections in the cornea. And this can even lead to severe infection inside the eye. They can even be blind. Having said that, if, properly taken care of. Contact lenses are a very good solution. They are actually optically better than spectacles. So if the person is responsible, is very careful, meticulous, and motivated enough, 
contact lenses are a very good solution. But you have to be very, you have to take all the precautions and you have to be mindful that you do not wear them for an extended period of time. You have to follow certain rules, take very good care of your lenses, wash them with proper solution, don't waste them, wear them for more than six to eight hours, whatever the best quality lenses you have. All right, thank you, Dr. Prabhu. So, Prof. Ehab, we have questions for you now. Uh, yeah. Does wearing here headphones and listening to music all day affects our hearing? What do you want to hear? <laughs> See, I, I will tell you one thing from, from uh, uh, medical aspect and from my experience. Whatever you do um, logically and nicely, it will never affect you. Whatever you do it aggressively and without limit or control, it will affect even if it is benign. Meaning that, uh, like Dr. Prapal said, that uh, when you are looking all the time for uh, at, the, at your devices and uh, uh, handphone, laptop, and, and, and what do you think your eye will be affected or not? Of course, it will be affected like Dr. Parapal said. Also, the hearing is like that. When you are, uh, uh, it is not also uh, affection on the hearing system itself. No, the God created the external canal open. Why? just to be aerated. And when it is not aerated, it will start fungus. It will start infection. It will start otitis extend. That's why a lot, a lot of people that yeah, they are using the headphones and uh, you know the receptionist, they, uh, they are hearing, uh, you know, they are talking to the customers and they are putting the headphones all the time. And, and a lot of them, they have fungal infection. A lot of them, they have otitis extend. And the friction of the, uh, when you are putting, for example, AirPods or, or the friction of the device with the external auditory canal skin, it will bring trauma and it will bring infection and otitis externa. So it is not only the effect on the auditory system or hearing. Yes, it will affect with, uh, with the uh, prolonged time and continuity, but again, on the external canal, it will affect uh, and it will affect also the uh, wax function. Why? Because I said that uh, the, all the wax, it is in the anterior one third of the canal. So when you put anything, cotton bud or hearing, uh, hearing uh, the, the airpods, whatever this, you will push the wax inside the canal. So it will be where? In the bony canal. Okay, so it, it is in abnormal position. It will affect and block the external auditory canal. It will affect the hearing and for the sensory neuron with time it will happen. So please do whatever you want, enjoy, but don't destroy yourself. Yeah, thanks for the advice, doctor. <laughs> I guess we have another question for you. Um, what is the etiology and pathophysiology of pulsatile tinnitus? And are there any treatment options for it? Okay, uh, I think we, we need until Sunday we will talk about the false style ten tinnitus. <laughs> Actually, tinnitus is a noisy, uh, uh, it is a noise of the ear. And um, uh, in Bahasa, you call it boni. At a boni or not, when you ask the patient. And uh, you, you know that the tinnitus, it has uh, uh, pulsatile and non-pulsatile, but it is long story. It is around 62 causes in the body. And mostly all the body, all the organs can bring tinnitus, especially the head and neck organs. So if you are talking about vascular, if you are talking about tumors, if you are talking about blood flow, if you are talking about hyperdynamic circulation, everything can bring tinnitus, okay? So it is not only the, uh, the ear can bring. And by the way, <laughs> the ears are the least. It's not the least, but it is, uh, there are a lot of common things more than this. Like the cervical spine, like the uh, spasm of the neck muscles, like the uh, pressure on the uh, big vessels of the uh, neck, uh, 
I will give it because it is a, like I said, it is a very, very big topic. One of the biggest topic in, in I, I cannot just make it short, but I will tell you overall, there are 60% that can be treated, treatable and 40% doesn't respond. And our famous comment to the patient with the tinnitus, because the tinnitus, you know that it, it, it bothers the patient a lot at night when there is a quietness. And this is really, really, it is not nice feeling. I hope that there is any one of you that doesn't uh, uh, feel it or experience it, but it is awful. And it will be like someone really talking to you or bothering you at night when you want to sleep and you want to rest. Uh, so we always comment one thing, forget about the tinnitus, it will forget about you. You think about it, it will never go. <clears throat> so if you have a patient, because actually the tinnitus also, it will be treated by physicians, it will be treated by uh, some of the surgeons, like the vascular surgeons, it will, be it will be treated by a lot of discipline. So please advise them, okay? Don't think about it. If it goes with the medication, because also the tinnitus, one of the thing, whatever pulse style or not, because the pulse style, this is usually related to the vascular and it's related even some of them, you know, when you press on the carotid, it will disappear. And this is actually a test. We do it in the, but don't press a lot. <laughs> and, and don't press in a wrong area. So when you press on the carotid artery, this, uh, uh, we do it in the clinic sometimes to know it is vascular or not. <clears throat> and uh, uh, again, the middle ear, it has some of the causes. But as, as I said, the most important in tinnitus is to find the cause. Number two, tell the patient, I'll give you treatment, but don't think about it. If it improved and subsided, thank God. If it didn't, forget it. Right, thank you, doctor. <clears throat> Due to time constriction, we have like last two questions, one each for uh, doctor and prof. So uh, we start with the first question for Prof Iha. Can a student with one-sided hearing loss become a doctor? Yes, can. Do you have any comment? When, when, uh, when uh, I, I used to be in, uh, in Johor Bahru, in Sultan Amina Hospital, I was the head of the SOXO committee uh, for three years when I was there. And, and uh, uh, you know that the ears give 50% uh, disabled, but the two ears, I mean that uh, sensory neural hearing loss uh, bilaterally. Uh, if, uh, if you are one-sided, uh, you can, of course, you can be uh, practicing. And by the way, it's, there is a lot of doctors, they have sensory neural hearing loss, a lot. And it can come actually when you are a doctor. But uh, in, in, uh, in Malaysia, the routine that uh, when you have, uh, uh, we have committees in the MMC that they will see the cases individually, case by case. And then they will approve uh, or disapprove the, uh, the work. But uh, uh, globally, of course, you can join with one ear. And some um, and a, a lot of uh, doctors, like I said, we are human. <clears throat> Actually, after forty years of age, we have what we call presbyacusis. And presbyacusis it means sensory neural hearing loss. The curve that I show you until two k. Remember the V dip uh, for the um, uh, noise induced hearing loss. No, in presbyacusis for age, it will come two k and it will go down sloping all the time. It will never come back to uh, normal. And this is the normal curve with the age. And uh, all of us, after 40 years, it is a must to come? No, it is not. Maybe you are 60 years and perfectly hearing. No. But most of the people after 40, 45 years of age, all the organs will start to function less. And uh, one of them is pressed by accused. And uh, uh, by the way, there is a lot of doctors globally, uh, they have uh, hearing aids. Okay. Uh, it will differ in, in uh, for the physicians, for the auscultation, for, for, but uh, uh, like I said, it is case by case. And uh, I never heard that sensory neural hearing loss, uh, unilateral or uh, uh, mild or moderate uh, 
bilateral stop uh, working. Don't worry. All right. Thank you, Prof. Ihat, for very good sharing. So we have one last question for Dr. Prabhu from Prof. Jaraman. Today, normal people are adopting to technology-centric approach instead of human-centric. Don't you think technology is a good substitute for blind people? Uh, I do not get the part of the question when it's good substitute for blind people. I believe it's in, I believe when ophthalmology as a speciality was greatly revolutionized by technology. My entire reason for picking up ophthalmology was because it's the most tech savvy branch, I thought. And uh, yes, in the management for blindness, technology has played an enormous role. So it's wonderful. We have a bionic eye for people with blind, uh, with, with river, with the, you know, which what we thought was uh, not treatable blindness is now a bionic eye. And technology has really uh, revolutionized the lives and the management of blindness, if that was a part of the question. But then the question was, a substitute technology. I strongly believe technology is not the substitute. It can be an aid. It can never substitute a human centric approach. It blind people not do not need sympathy, but they need empathy. We need to understand as health professionals and especially as a health professional educator, I think empathy for this large section of the society, we do not consider them as a burden on the society. They, with technology, their lives and their active participation in the society can be made, uh, they can be included in the society and technology can play a very important part in it, but not substitute a human-centered approach. Technology can just probably aid us. I hope I, am on, I was able to answer the question. All right, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Prabhu and Prof. Ihat for this very interactive Q&A session. And I guess we'll now go into a very short five minutes intermission. At the meantime, play a very short promotional video from our sponsor today, the Star Eye Specialist Malaysia. I am the giver of clear vision to let you see your loved ones to let you be yourself free of glasses or contact lenses I can help you have healthy eyes the caretaker for your parents' sight and the protector of your child's ability to see. I am Vista. I have helped people see from blur to clear since 1999. I am the giver of confidence, beauty and safety and to empower you to fulfill your dreams. I am here to help you enjoy life with clear vision. I am here to hold your hand throughout your vision journey. I am Vista.
Did you know that people with short sighted actually have a longer eyeball compared to people with normal vision? So that's why it is important to measure your eyeball whenever you visit ophthalmologists or optometrists for a comprehensive eye examination. And this machine helps to measure the length of the eyeball accurately within a shorter time. Are you a big fan of video games? Have you ever heard about virtual reality before? Did you know that virtual reality can be used to treat lazy eye? Not only it's fun and it has a lot of game choices and kids love it. Instead of doing regular lazy eye treatments, kids can now improve their eyesight through VR games too. Alright, welcome back everyone. For a short reminder, participant, you could also send in or email the questions to Prof Ehab and Dr. Prabal. Due to the time restriction, we are not able to finish all the questions asked. So sorry for the inconvenience. Now, we delve into the second part of this webinar. This afternoon, we are very fortunate to have the Malaysian Association for the Blind joining us to share about how we can help the visually impaired community. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mr. George Thomas. Mr. George is the Chief Executive Officer of Malaysian Association for the Blind with a demonstrated history of developmental work, improving marginalized communities in advocacy, economics, activities, and leadership for the past 30 years. He is skilled in strategic planning, business development, marketing strategy, and event management. He also has a very strong business development professional with an honor degree focused in Bachelor of Agriculture and Science and a Master's in Business Management. Now, let us welcome Mr. George. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and then uh, we are honored uh, to be part of uh, this program uh, of Taylor's and uh, at MAB or the Malaysian Association for the Blind is uh, indeed uh, very honored to be working with you. And then, as you have heard from uh, two uh, very knowledgeable or uh, very, very strong uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Paul and Dr. Iba, I'm very fortunate to also learn a few things from them. Okay, um, very quickly, I'll just uh, share with you uh, what, what I'm going to do. Actually, I just share with you uh, probably the the demographics uh, of uh, blindness. Okay, um, I, I believe uh, you all know that globally visual impairment. Okay, as uh, Dr. Bal has said about 265, okay, 253 million visually impaired persons and estimated about 40 to 42 million uh, blind people from the population of 7 billion people. Uh, and uh, if you know, in Malaysian uh, demographics, uh, by uh, stated by the National uh, Eye Survey, uh, we have a prevalence rate of 2.44 uh, through the pocket survey done by NES or the National Eye Survey. There should be about 780,000 estimated blind people or visually impaired people in this country, of which, according to the prevalence rate, there should be 90,000 blind people, totally blind people in this country from a population of 32 million people. But we have only 51,540 people registered as visually impaired as of December 2020. So there's a big gap, if you may see, from... Uh, 780 and 51,000. So what could be the cost? And I would think uh, registration for uh, blind uh, is, is still voluntary. And most of the hard to see people or low vision people uh, are still or visually impaired, are still not registering or there is a stigma so they do not want to register. And uh, this is very prevalent as we also run a low vision clinic 
there are a lot of people come and buy devices uh, for low vision, but they do not want to register. So we have a lot of them in that category. And uh, okay, as Malaysian Association for the Blind, uh, we are the premier voluntary organization for visually impaired people in this country. And we, our services are provided to all blind and uh, we also prevent the tragedy of avoidable blindness through our various programs. And we were established, our Emotion Association for the Blind was established in 1951 uh, by the then Social uh, Welfare Department. And uh, it became an NGO uh, later on. And uh, we are, uh, we now cover the whole country uh, for with our services and so forth. And uh, why are we created, uh, why are we established is basically uh, to create equal opportunities for the blind so that they also can en enable themselves to enjoy the same quality of life as all of us. And uh, our mission is to provide services and opportunities for greater participation so that we are able to integrate them into society and promote, we also uh, promote a lot of uh, prevention of blindness. And if you go uh, back, we were established in 1951. Uh, and uh, over the years, uh, as an NGO, we have had uh, our presidents and uh, our past presidents are from 1953. And then our longest serving president was late uh, young Abdul Hamad uh, for 15 years. And uh, our current president is uh, Young Mulia Tan Sri Dato Sri Tunku Azlan. And then, uh, okay, where and how we reach out to the visually impaired. As I mentioned, we have about uh, 51,000 registered blind people. We reach out to 2,000 blind people every year, at least 2,000 to 2,500. And now over the years, even though because of the pandemic and the MCO, I think uh, last year and this year, we have uh, surpassed uh, more than 2,005 or 3,000 blind people, uh, especially in reaching out for with aid for uh, assistance for food and relief. And uh, if you see the various areas where we uh, go into or reach out, include uh, training centers, our uh, child center, our job placements, our welfare, and also our rehab programs and other services which include sports and so forth. The services which we render include uh, vocational and rehabilitation training, awareness and advocacy, job placement, uh, braille and talking book library, low vision uh, unit, a clinical session, uh, braille and book publishing, braille, uh, we, we create textbooks for, for the schools, then our welfare services, which include our relief and so forth, especially during this one and a half years, we have been very active in, in relief work, uh, reaching out the whole of Peninsula, not only Peninsula, but also Sabah and Sarawak. And we also have a research unit where we work with universities, especially in the technology, like Dr. Paul, uh, Dr. Jerome was saying about technology. We work with a lot of universities, especially in tech area so that we can have uh, assistive devices lively uh, in order to increase the quality of life of blind people. And uh, maybe later on I'll explain to you uh, more on that. Then we also are very active on ICT and assistive uh, technology. And uh, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, what we do we have three educational training centers. We have a welfare and community based care hub. Then we have welfare services. We have deaf, blind, and a multi disabled uh, center. We have advocacy and accessibility. We have social enterprising. We have also job placement. And uh, we have research and uh, development. We, the people who benefit or whom we can uh, reach out is to children. Uh, newly born blind up to the age of 16 years and our vocational training centers where we admit them 
uh, from the age of 16 and above. And we also have elderly club. Uh, in short, we could say that uh, from, uh, from, uh, what? from birth to death, we, we are there for a visually impaired. When a newly born blind, uh, we assist the parents in counseling. We also assist them uh, in, in managing uh, uh, the child so that uh, our emphasis is to get them into schools or into uh, education, into mainstream education. And we try to uh, encourage them to do that. And for preschool, we also have preschool services where we, we assist them. And in vocational training, those after school, all those who are not able to continue school, school or those who have adult uh, blindness, okay, we do help them in uh, in vocational training so that they are able to earn some uh, some uh, what income from uh, so that they can live a life uh, as normal person. We also have a lot of programs for elderly blind. We have an elderly blind uh, rehab center. We also have uh, uh, what activities for retired blind people or even uh, all, all sorts of uh, gatherings and so forth. But this during this pandemic, I think those activities were, were uh, not possible, but we have been able to do it online and things like that. And, uh, and also it has been a big challenge for employment and uh, income earning or wealth creation for the visually impaired. And like what Dr. Paul was saying, uh, the num uh, previously cataract used to be the highest uh, the same worries and all people who come and register with us. But we see now a very big increasing number of people with uh, retinal pigmentosa and uh, glaucoma. And this is uh, a big concern because I think in the last 10 years, uh, I think these people who register with us is maybe threefold uh, higher. And that's why we also feel uh, after 40 day, the multiplication of uh, adult blindness is increasing by threefold every decade. And uh, we also see that uh, with uh, medical uh, interventions, there are a lot of uh, blind with additional disabilities. We see a lot of blind, uh, deaf blind cases uh, increasing in this country. And we also have a lot of blind with uh, cerebral palsy and uh, the same. So we have trained staff, trained instructors for deaf blind at the moment. And we have been able to work with the Ministry of Education to introduce uh, deaf blind children into schools. And we have 80 deaf blind children in schools at the moment. Okay, this is our preschool program, which we run uh, the same. And we also not only have blind, but we also have blind with additional disabilities, as I mentioned. So uh, we run this at the moment only in Kuala Lumpur, but we hope to expand this in future. And uh, we have three vocational training centers. Uh, and uh, these uh, vocational training centers are for children above 16 years. And we have, and these are all residential and we have what, uh, 120 blind persons each year uh, in, in the programs. We run uh, semis, two semesters a year and they uh, have uh, structured courses. The three training centers we have, one is in Gurney Training Center. Here, this Gurney Training Center in Kuala Lumpur, we offer certificate courses, uh, which is uh, JTK or skills uh, CJ Kamara Malaysia, uh, level three and level four. So we run five uh, programs, massage, uh, reflexology, computer literacy and computer uh, management. And also uh, we also have audio production and we also have uh, management, office management course. In Kinta Rehabilitation Center, we do basically we open up the center uh, for adult blind where we have uh, a lot of them uh, at least uh, each time we have
do about uh, 20 of them attending the course for uh, those who are adult blind for short courses, especially for communication, braille, and for uh, mobility, orientation, and uh, so forth. Then we also have an agriculture training center where we teach uh, animal and sedentary agriculture. Uh, you will be also surprised that uh, blind people can manage agriculture, conventional agriculture, and now we are also into hydroponics and so forth. We are also into greenhouses, and they also rare fish, rare chicken, and we also have uh, handicraft, uh, rattan weaving, and uh, woodware, and so forth. So these are the three training centers, and the courses, certificate courses which we offer, uh, we we also have supplementary courses, enrichment courses and programs. So this, these are the computer system and operation and administration courses. Uh, and uh, they use the normal computer. And it is because of uh, technology uh, with the applications, uh, software, that they're able to, the screen is able to read and uh, create a voice, whatever they type uh, on the screen. And uh, they use a normal keyboard. Uh, if you know what a typing skill is this, so we teach them how to type first. So then you don't need to, a typist never look at the keyboard. So just like that, uh, you can uh, use the keyboard without looking, a blind person can see, I mean, can, can use that. So they have a uh, level three and even a level four course, which leads to a diploma level. We also have, uh, uh, office management. Okay, this is uh, another uh, other than the computer. We also have office certificate level two and level three. We also have a run, which is the most popular course, foot and the hand and uh, reflexology as well as massage. This is the most popular course uh, in our center in in Kuala Lumpur. And there are about three thousand over uh, blind people who are masseurs or, or reflexologists. We also have enrichment courses, which uh, are Braille, Yoga, ICT, and so forth. We also have supplementary courses, which are like uh, anatomy. You can see uh, they learn anatomy also. They use a uh, actual replica anatomy, which I think uh, your college also could be uh, using that. Anyway, uh, and we also, a lot of our work is also through computers and uh, the thing. And, verbalizing them is very important so which is uh, very important and we also have uh, audio production vocal training we also have a sample wellness center where the trainees get to experience real life uh, training we have uh, outsiders who come for massage so they are and they are learned to how to manage the day we also have run a broadcasting uh, course how uh, blind people can be djs how even uh, blind people can set up uh, audio production center at this thing. We also have assistive technology. Uh, actually, uh, like uh, previous Dr. Bal was saying about technology, in just this 10 years, technology has really revolutionized the way people, blind people live. Last time, a lot of people needed uh, information through Braille and audio uh, cassettes, audio tapes, and audio you see. But now, uh, information is just available on their handphone. Blind people can use a handphone and take a grab. Blind people can use a handphone and uh, buy things through Lazada. Blind people can, uh, as normal, but only thing, what we are working with the government, especially in the websites and all these applications, to make sure that they are compliant with uh, WCAG, which is web content or web uh, compatible uh, accessible guidelines, so that uh, the system or, or the applications or they do are accessible to the blind. That is the, so uh, the software the screen reader is accessible to blind. And in the iPhone also, there are a lot of softwares which are free. You can download and use them as a screen reader to magnify or even uh, take a photo of uh, your neighbor and see uh, how old the person is or what, how easy and 
who uh, whether he's talking to the right person or not. You can key in and say, okay, I'm I'm uh, this is Nicole, and then next time I see, I can I use my phone, and it will say, yeah, Nicole is in front of you. So th th this technology like that also uh, at the moment and current moment. As I mentioned, the other training center is our agriculture training center. We also do a lot of handicraft work there, uh, training, and uh, we also sell these handicraft products and uh, marketing them. And then uh, we also have started up um, uh, what it may be shop uh, as a one-stop center. Actually, it's a shop uh, which uh, gives services for reflexology and massage. We have it in uh, Rex scale in Mid Valley, and we used to have it in Bukit Tinggi. But we have uh, it during this MCO, we had to close it down. And we used to have it in scale also, we had to close it down uh, because uh, of the uh, pandemic and because of the closure. And so, and, and this uh, just early this month, we also uh, opened up a radio MAB. This is to prove. To, uh, to to the world that uh, blind people can, and this for your information, this radio maybe is uh, run on Zeno FM, it's an online uh, radio, and it's a community radio for the blind, but we have 4,000 listeners, uh, not only the blind, but also the uh, normal people, and our, and this radio was totally set up by visually impaired people, and that's what uh, technology uh, actually can uh, create uh, the thing. And we had the minister also to launch and minister was also very uh, thing and he has also supported to expand this radio. In, uh, for. We also uh, look uh, give a lot of hand holding to the visually impact. And during this pandemic, uh, we are also grateful to the community and uh, public at large because uh, we had got, we got good support which in which we could even help people in some and some work too. And uh, okay, when we come to job opportunities, maybe 10 years or 20 years ago, we were fighting at the doors of universities to open doors for visually impaired to study. At that point of time, we felt education is very important and academically they can excel because in schools, getting a five, uh, straight fives for SPM, SCPM, uh, I mean, straight A's is not a sweat for the blind. And uh, among the PWDs or people with disabilities, uh, blind people uh, are the foremost in academic uh, achievements. So, and there were less opportunities of those time, 20 years back to go into universities and so forth. And now we have another great challenge when you're highly qualified, when you're a degree holder or your master's or your PhD, they don't have employment. People still uh, uh, have the stigma, oh, I have a graduate, but he's a blind person, how can I employ him? So that is the biggest challenge for us now. So high academically qualified more challenges. There are about more than 400 visually impaired in the past 20 years we have had and have earned degrees and even PhDs, there are a lot of them uh, who are also, and I still have one PhD holder who still cannot find a job. And a lot of them are lecturers and uh, uh, they say, we have 280 blind teachers in mainstream schools. And we are fortunate uh, the government opened the doors for them. And uh, government promotes one person uh, employment in the public sector for persons with disability. But as of December, 2020, only 0.3% are PWDs, not blind only, but even people with disabilities, only 0.3% are employed uh, in the public sector. And we are still fighting uh, with that because uh, they categorize the uh, jobs available for the PWDs are only those in the lower rung. The higher officers, executives or seniors still are not available, but there are a lot of graduates of uh, blind people who are underemployed. There are a lot of graduates who spend three, four years in universities, couldn't get a job, come back and do a one year massage course and go and become messieurs. It is a sad state. 
so uh, we we uh, we also like I mentioned the lowest uh, uh, number of people employed with the public sector at the line, and we also trying to now uh, embark on uh, creating positive image of the blind. Uh, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, when you think about blind in Malaysia, they think they can only weave basket and make a, a rotan chairs and rotan uh, the same. And now, still, they feel they can only do massage. But if you ask me, we have lawyers, we have uh, town planners, we have uh, legal advisors for the state, we have uh, lecturers, uh, we have even uh, uh, what uh, people who do uh, who are advisors for for ministers and so forth who are visually impaired also. So we are also looking at uh, doing success stories, and we are working with some universities and some uh, uh, some uh, uh, what like TM and all to do success stories because we have also like I mentioned to you earlier that a lot of them who are in their 30s and 40s, because of glaucoma or retino, uh, uh, retinopathy, they become blind. And you are, a, uh, I, I've got a, a researcher who is in uh, telecoms, who at the age of 40 suddenly became, became blind. What does he do? There's a big trauma there. And we were lucky because of the technology of today, we were able to place him back in the same position and same as the thing, and he is able to uh, do the job. So technology has been able to do this thing. And there are a lot of uh, teachers, I do not know, maybe because of too much strain on the thing, getting blind, and we have been, managed to place them back in the employment uh, with the technology and, and the thing. And uh, employment is, is the biggest challenge we have now. And uh, so we have also gone into uh, working with MDEC and so forth uh, to develop entrepreneurship. And uh, we have a lot of, and this uh, pandemic has also forced a lot of visually impaired to be online uh, sales and online uh, marketing uh, people. And uh, we, we have a lot of them who have been successful selling uh, their wares or reselling items sold by others. And uh, can earn uh, a very uh, even though the massage or the reflexology has opened, uh, only the seniors seem to get back at least eighty percent of their customers because they have regulars. Whereas those who are in the market the first year or second year are still new. They depend a lot on walking customers. So that is a big issue because walking customers has dropped by eighty percent. Only the regulars are comfortable or feel safe to go back to them. And we are also, uh, I think, negotiating with the government to make sure that all, especially the messios and those who are attending uh, buskers to get vaccinated so the public are confident to, to avail their services. We are also creating technology, because of technology, we are also using uh, platforms for buskers to go online to sell their records and sell their songs so for for an earning, so these these are the challenges which employment is in. Braille, braille and access uh, to information. Okay, uh, braille is still very relevant even with technology which can uh, use uh, to read and create the voice, because uh, even with all this technology and this thing, for the sighted we still have to learn the alphabets and L still even though our text messages are all short form. We still need to learn the vocabulary and the spellings. So Braille is still very important and we still teach them, but we want better access to information. Information is easily available. And uh, now uh, for graduates, it's so easy for the blind because everything is, you don't have to come to the library to print into Braille. Everything is available on your computer. Uh, but only thing we we are like forcing or we are trying to get MCMC to see that everybody follow the WCAG so that uh, is compliant to their softwares. There are about 2,500 children in mainstream schools uh, and blind children. And every year there are about 60 to 80 uh, blind children enrolling each year. 
There are about 30 students in colleges and universities and with three to six enrolling universities every year. We produce uh, Braille textbooks for schools from our Braille publishing unit. We also uh, Braille uh, name cards, even the PM or, or most of the ministers also use Braille, uh, Braille name cards also. So we also encourage and we do it for a service for that. And uh, volunteering, okay. We have assistance services. So there are a lot of blind people, but at, at this point of time, uh, we are only able to help people uh, around Klein Valley and uh, Ipo. But we hope to extend the services. We are looking at uh, uh, technology vendors to create uh, e-platforms for such services uh, to help. We help the elderly blind. Uh, we get volunteers to read for the elderly blind. We also get uh, volunteers to take the elderly blind if they have to go for medical checkup, if they have to go to the bank, if they have to go to the government office and things like that. So we do that and uh, we, and that is, we have a lot of uh, volunteers who help us in that. Then we also encourage or we also get a lot of group sales activities and uh, all our three centers to do painting or murals or, or even uh, uh, get together. Uh, we have a lot of uh, universities and a lot of uh, corporate bodies who have interactive games, interactive session uh, with the blind uh, trainees in our centers. We, our PR and fundraising sector also uh, uses a lot of volunteers because we have road shows. So there are people who sign up for the road shows and we have in different towns. So we get the volunteers to assist. We also have our mail appeal and so forth. So they also do small fundraising products. We also have audio production. We still do CDs. There are a lot of blind people uh, in our library. We have a library. So we have a lot of people who do recording. We have audio uh, studios in our center. And we also do Braille books. And Braille books, we have volunteers uh, who we post the books to them. They came in their computer. They just email back and we can convert it into Braille. So we have that also. Then we have a lot of uh, sports activities, which we need a lot of volunteers uh, for events. So we also have a lot of volunteers for that. So, and uh, for volunteers, okay, you can uh, uh, email to us or call us and the person in charge is Mano Gayatri. So you can uh, volunteer any, anyone and we, uh, we have nearly 2000 volunteers, but uh, that uh, about three to 400 are very active. And we also encourage uh, this thing. And what is the impact uh, in your activities you can create for us is uh, all the sustainable this thing. And uh, we can eat our quality education, especially employment, and then reducing your qualities. And, and that's why integrating them in society and partnerships for goals so that we can work together, collaborate together. Then we also want uh, sustainable communities that is accessible if information, accessible information and accessible environment with uh, fa uh, fail free or pavements which are accessible to the blind so that they can walk and they can listen or they can commute freely in this uh, country. Uh, so that's uh, basically uh, about maybe in a short uh, the same. If you have any any questions, you can. Okay, that, that's about uh, the Malaysian Association for the Blind and the challenges that the blind face and the sick. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. George, for such an inspiring and motivational sharing. I believe now all of us have a better understanding for the blind community in Malaysia, and so we have. I guess we have a few questions for Mr. George as well, and uh, can we? Directed to the Slido link now. We have okay. two or three few questions. While you're waiting for the questions, may I just thank and express my gratitude to, to Mr. George. You are doing an amazing job and uh, so much of contribution to the society. I really hope uh, you know we are meeting on this platform. Perhaps when the 
this pandemic and situations improve, we can get our students for a field trip. Maybe that's going to educate them and under help them understand the problems for this better. Yeah, thank you, doctor. And then we encourage people uh, to visit us because uh, just seeing pamphlets and seeing information uh, is not convincing. So we, we, we encourage people to visit us so you can have a first-hand view of how we run or how, how these people do their chores as uh, the thing. And for your information, we have 80 uh, full-time staff of which 40% uh, of our staff are visually impaired. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, if you, uh, we are a total uh, NGO uh, and we only get eight to 10% funding from the government. Uh, 60 per, 50 to 60 percent of uh, funding comes from public. Oh, that's and, really commendable, uh, Mr. George, and I really hope uh, once things improve, I think it's a very important part in the journey of medical students who are going to be doctors or healthcare professionals. It's very important for them to understand this aspect. So I hope we can uh, do some collaboration on that. Yeah, sure. We, we, I believe we, we, there's some questions for you. Okay. Yeah, all right. So the first question for Mr. George is, where can people with normal vision learn Braille? Braille? Okay, uh, we, we teach Braille. Okay, uh, through our radio, we are planning to introduce online uh, Braille classes. So uh, we will announce, uh, I mean, uh, I believe from July onwards, we should be studying that online uh, classes. All right, and second question. Um, there are some blind elderly who are not aware of such services provided for them. Is there any solution for this? Okay, usually uh, what happens, uh, a lot of people, especially uh, other than uh, Klang Valley, I don't know, but uh, I, would, I would think also uh, it's good that the university has also uh, come. Uh, but there are a lot of normal people when somebody uh, loses eyesight or somebody has a difficulty in eyesight, then only they look where the services are. Until then, uh, I think uh, uh, MAB is also invisible a bit, but we are trying to promote uh, uh, it uh, more of the services. And uh, any blind person, what we do is in any uh, part of the country, they can register themselves with the welfare department they will refer to us. Um, and I'm quite happy, especially with Pahang, Negri Simla, and Mlaka, all the clinics, all the uh, hospitals in Pahang, Negri Simla, and Mlaka, they refer directly to us, uh, any visually impaired. And we have staff who go around there to uh, do a, a check and then advise them where they can avail for services and uh, whatever they, they need. All right, thank you, Mr. George, for answering this question. Indeed, they are very meaningful and hope we can help more blind community in Malaysia. All right, thank you. Thank so you, now, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Mr. George. Yes. So now, we, I'll pass the time to Erfan and Sawish, who will be leading us in a time of fun field activities. Participants, please do not be shy and take part in this interactive session. As the winners, we win away with gifts sponsored by our sponsor today. Shout out and thanks to Vista Eye Specialist Malaysia. Thank you, Irfan. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarif. Um, so Irfan and I will be conducting a short interactive session today. Basically, all of us will be playing um, a game where I will be describing three different um, personalities from the blind and deaf community who have been successful. And you will have three opportunities um, to guess who we are describing. There'll be three rounds. So you'll have three opportunities to guess and win a set of dry eye kit. Um, so I'll just be um, letting you all know the rules and regulations right now. So if you see the slide right now, my friend Irfan is sharing a QR code. If you scan this QR code, you'll be able to see an option where you can submit your answer. Um, so please no take note that when you submit your answers and guesses um, during the um, game, um, please include your name in the bracket 
so that um, if you do guess correctly, we know who you are and you'll be able to win the gift. Um, so um, it's first come first serve basis. Um, so please take note um, that the answers without names will not be entertained. So I really hope that every one of you are willing to participate and make this a lively session. If you have any questions, you can unmute and um, ask me or anyone here. So um, without further ado, I think we can begin this session. Okay, so the first personality that I'm gonna be describing today, um, she's a female and an American chef, writer and TV host. Does anyone have any idea who she is? She is visually impaired. That's another clue. If you do, oh, okay. There's an answer in the chat box from Iswal Mazlan. And yes, that is the answer. However, can we accept the answer from the chat box or only from the Slido um, link? Can anyone please advise me on that? I think we'll proceed with the Slido first answer. Hira Christine Ha. Okay, okay. All right. So thank you, Hira. Um, you guessed it correctly. So you're the winner today. Okay, right, so Hira. um we'll move on to the next one. Okay, so the next person that I'm gonna describe is an American actor, producer, and musician, a male and he's completely blind in one eye, specifically his left eye. So please also note that, um, please submit your answers via the Slido link so that we can identify a winner. Wow, Hira, again. <laughs> awesome, congratulations. Yeah. That's correct. Um, but I think we'll give the second guesser, Vidya. right? Okay. Vidya. Okay. So the winner is Vidya. Okay. Congratulations, Congratulations Vidya. Vidya. Yeah. Okay. So thank you for participating, guys. Um, we'll move on to the next personality that I'm going to be uh, describing. So this person is born in December 1770. So many of you might not be very familiar with him. He's a German composer and pianist. And he's most admired in the history of Western music. So if you have any guesses, please submit them right now. If you can't guess them, then I'll maybe give you all more clues. Oh, there's a lot of answers. Thank you guys for participating. We got the first hit. Wait. Yeah. Can you reveal who's the re who's the person? Um yeah. yeah, so Vidya, you won again. So I think I'll be describing another person. <laughs> so uh Okay, Vidya actually guessed it right. It's actually Ludwig um, van Beethoven. But since you already won the second round just now, I think I'll be giving another chance for someone else to guess. I have another personality in mind. So I'll be describing him right now. Okay, so he's an American singer, songwriter, musician, and record producer. Um, and he's one of the most successful musicians musicians in the 20th century. And he has won 22 Grammy Awards. He's visually impaired. If you have any idea, please submit your answers as soon as possible. Yes, that is correct as well. Thank you so much. It's Stevie Wonder. So we have um, all three winners now. Yeah. Right, congratulations as well. Okay, so now I'll yeah, be, I'll um, yeah, I'm going to screen share. Is that okay, Irfan? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing. 
Thank you. Okay, uh, once again, I want to thank everyone for participating in the interactive session just now. Um, we got a lot of good answers, even though some of them were wrong, but thank you for participating. It was awesome. So the first person that I described was Christine Ha. Um, something special about her, she's actually a self-taught chef. And Christine actually um, lost her sight to an autoimmune disease called neuromyelitis optica. It's something even I didn't know. But no matter what, she didn't let this get to her and um, stop her from achieving really great things. Um, I can't even imagine cooking if I'm blind, but she managed to win um, a competition, a prestigious cooking competition um, in US. And I think it's a really big achievement. She has her own cookbook now and she's also um, going as um, judges um, in reality TV um, cooking shows. I think it's a really big deal and it's something commendable. So the next person that I actually described is Johnny Depp. Um, he's an American actor, producer, and musician. Um, he's very famous and he's also one of my favorite actors actually. And um, not, I think not everyone knows that he's actually um, partially um, blind in one eye. Um, but yeah, it's actually a secret about him that he actually revealed in one of his interviews. And he's well known um, for his character, um, Captain Jack Sparrow in Pirates of the Caribbean film series. Um, so this is a little about him. And the third one that I actually um, talked about is Ludwig van Beethoven. Um, actually not a lot of you knew who he was, but um, Vidya did, so um, congratulations again. And he's actually one of the most um, admired musicians um, in the history of Western music. And some of his main compositions were actually done when he was deaf. So um, it's actually really cool if you think about it. And the last but not least is Stevie Wonder. Um, he's an American singer and he's actually one of the most successful um, singers because he sold over um, 100 million records worldwide. I think not uh, everyone, I think no one has actually beaten this record yet. Um, so it, it actually made him one of the best-selling music artists of all time. So um, I think that's all from me. Um, thank you so much, everyone. It was so wonder wonderful having all of you participate and submitting your answers. Um, thank you. I'll all right, thank you. you. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Sarish, and thank you, Ifan, for conducting this session. So once again, congratulations to Hira, Vidya, and Izwa. Each of you will be receiving a dry eye kit set sponsored by our sponsor today. Shout out and thank you to Vista Eye Specialist Malaysia. Our community will be getting in touch with you to get your mailing address. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the closing ceremony of our I Hear You webinar. With all that, we've learned today about proper eye and ear health care. I hope that everyone can apply this knowledge into our daily life and live a healthier life. And once more, you are required to fill in the feedback survey in order to get your certificate. All right, moving along. We also like to hear more from you. Thus, you can send us the feedback about this webinar, like I just said, through the Google link that is displayed now as well. Okay, moving on. Tooms has also organized a World Cancer Day charity fundraiser. You are free to donate any amount of your choice, but for donations more than 40 ringgits, you'll be receiving a limited editions of World Cancer Day t-shirt. All proceeds collected will be channeled to National Cancer Society of Malaysia. You can scan the QR code or click into the link shared in the Zoom chat box to donate now. All right, before we end the webinar, we'd like to have a photo op session with all of you. Can everyone kindly turn on your camera? We'd like to capture this very special and very, very memorable moment with all of you and also see those faces behind the camera room, all right? All right, please turn on your camera, thank you so much. All right, while we are waiting, once again, we thank you for your patience and the willingness to join us and free up your time for this very wonderful and very meaningful webinar. 
I hope that you have learned a lot from it and you can use it in your daily life. All right. I guess that's all we have. Wait, sorry, I haven't. Yeah, wait, have you taken the picture? Yeah, once again, sorry. Okay, I think we take the picture now. Three, two, one. All right, I think we should take the picture on second page also. Three, two, one, the screenshots. And then the th third page as well. Screenshot it. Okay, all good. All right, thank you so much, everyone. All right, finally, thank you so much to the organizing committee for sparing your time and effort in arranging and organizing this event. Special thanks for to Prof Rosley, although he's not here today, but I still appreciate him. Also, Dr. Lavin Singh and Dr. Lim Suin for their leadership and support. As well as our three very great speakers, Dr. Prabal, Associate Professor Dr. Ihab Ali, and Mr. George Thomas. Once again, thank you, WISTA, for sponsoring this event. Most importantly, I'd like to thank you all our fellow participants of this event. We sincerely hope that you enjoyed this webinar. We couldn't have done this successfully without you, and we are looking forward to having you again as our audience in our future events. And well, that's a wrap. Thank you everyone for joining us. Wish you all a pleasant day and stay tuned for our next webinar. All our upcoming events are updated on our Facebook and Instagram accounts. Goodbye everyone, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you, Yonkren. Thank you everyone.